Hi everybody, welcome back into the Color Gemstone Academy. I am Paul DC, your instructor, and this is my YouTube channel, Paul DC Gemstones. Now, um, if you have not done so yet, I would ask that if you would kindly subscribe to this channel. It doesn't cost you a thing, but it really does help me out a lot. And as this is the first week of December at the time I'm taping this in 2020, we can't wait for 2020 to be over. Um, I am very close to 600 subscribers now, so push, if you could push me over the top, I would appreciate that. Remember, it doesn't cost you a thing. Well, first I'm going to start with my questions and comments sections like I do every week now. And let me look at this one. Uh, this, this comes from Sonia M. May I ask how to do a quick test to know if a gem is not just colored glass? I just tried to scratch a stone with a pair of scissors. Okay, Sonia, first of all, don't try and scratch a gemstone with anything. I, I, I know I told you that the Mohs scale of hardness is a test that, that determines what gem can scratch another gem. Uh, but you, you have to remember that things like scissors or blades are made of steel and that has a hardness probably better or higher than some of the gems that you might be trying to test. But yes, I do have kind of a kind of fun, quick way to determine if something is a gem versus glass or plastic. Uh, and it's actually very simple. I, I brought myself a little shot glass because this is a glass. This part above your uh, lip is very temperature sensitive. So if you take and put that glass, even if it's kind of cool outside, and then you take, well, I'm going to show you a big uh, citrine. The natural gem feels cooler on your lip, and that's why they called the diamonds ice because it felt cold. Now there's obviously a number of sophisticated tests that can be done without destroying a gemstone. So um, heavy liquids determines the specific gravity. Refractive index, you have a refractometer you can test. Uh, and there are destructive tests as well to find out, for example, if a gem has been dyed. Like if you had a turquoise and you're wondering was it turquoise dyed, well, you could put a little acetone on it in a place underneath where you can't see it. And if that color comes off, well, that has been dyed. So there's a couple of things that you can do. But for now, the kind of fun one, a uh, gem, a natural gem made of crystal is going to feel a little bit cool on the top of your lip. Okay. Diana L. asks, can you do a lesson on spinel? And she said, by the way, I'm, I'm paraphrasing everybody's questions. Because she said, is it a, like a ruby? Is it expensive? Is it actually a ruby? Is it just an imitation ruby? Uh, it's, not a, it's, it's its own gemstone, and I will do a lesson on spinel. It happens to be one of my favorite underrated gemstones out there. So stay tuned when I get around to doing that one. Tommy L. says, can you do a lesson on emeralds? I get so confused at how many different types of emeralds there are. Also, my dream is to own a raw red sapphire. I have to tell you, Tommy, um, that calling something a red sapphire is like nails on a chalkboard for me. Because remember, corundum is the gemstone that encompasses the family that encompasses both rubies and sapphires. Now, if, as, if this corundum is red, it is called a ruby. If it is any other color, including pink, it is called a sapphire. So I don't say anything as such, such as a red ruby, but I'll be happy to do something on a lesson on emeralds for you. And finally, from Sarma L, says, please consider a video on imitation turquoise, including howlite, phostite, verisite, etc. Well, that is the crux of what this, that this lesson is going to be today. And I'm going to call it turquoise, real, simulated, fakes, and wannabes. Okay, so we call it turquoise, real simulated fakes and wannabes. Now, what does that really mean? Well, obviously you love turquoise. I love turquoise. It's one of my favorite gemstones in the world. I've been to more turquoise mines probably than any other type of mine in the world that I visited. It's a fascinating gemstone and many of them are right here in the United States. But how do you know what you're getting is actually turquoise? Now, before I get into that, I want to remind everybody, if you look on episode 10, I did a lesson on something called Real Versus Fake, which was really a, an attention-getting title, but it's really talking about 
what is a simulated gemstone? What is a synthetic gemstone? What is a natural gemstone? So that might be good to brush up on that if you haven't uh, seen that lesson yet. Or my episode 21 is a lesson on what I called Turquoise 101, sort of a beginner's guide to all things turquoise. But let's get into the meat of this one that, uh, since you asked about it. Let's start with what is turquoise? What is the chemical composition of a turquoise? Well, turquoise is a hydrous phosphate of copper and aluminum, period. Hydrous phosphate of copper and aluminum. If what you're looking at doesn't have copper or aluminum, then it can't be turquoise. So I know that that's a mouthful, but let me tell you some of the other vital statistics because one of the ways that you can tell something isn't something else is if it doesn't have the proper Mohs scale rating, doesn't have the refractive index, doesn't have the specific gravity, and so on and so on. So let's first talk about again turquoise remember if you don't have copper you cannot have turquoise period that's why most turquoise is mined in and around copper mines so most scale of hardness it's between a five and a six on the most scale of hardness not the hardest of gemstones obviously diamond would be up there at 10 sapphires corundum would be at nine you have your topaz at eight quartz at seven. So five to six is not bad. It's something, especially since most turquoise these days is stabilized. And again, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, it's a pretty good and durable gemstone that you can wear every single day. The toughness is rated fair to good. Um, and remember, toughness is the ability to withstand chipping and cracking as opposed to scratching, which is the most scale uh, number. Uh, the crystal structure is triclinic. Now that's important because different gemstones, inc including some of your opaque gemstones, have different crystal structures. Those are a little bit harder to identify. You need a powerful microscope in order to do that. But again, if it's not triclinic, it's not going to be part of the turquoise group. Refractive index 1.61 to 1.65. That, that is a measure of the sparkle of a gemstone. Now we don't think of Turquoise is being very sparkly unless it has pyrite in it and it reflects that, you know, off of that pyrite. Uh, and specific gravity is considered to be 2.8. So let's start with is probably the biggest imposter of turquoise. Now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. It's called howlite. Now howlite was discovered and named, named after the gentleman who discovered it, who was Henry Howe. And I think that was in 1868, I want to say. Now, it's definitely a gem, but most of your howlite is basically a white sort of calcite looking stone. What makes it the ideal imposter for turquoise is number one, it, ex ex it accepts dyes very, very readily. It's easy to dye it almost any color that you want it to be. Um, and it also um, has that veining in it that looks like the veining or the matrix that you see in most of your turquoise. Okay, so I get it. The obvious question is, so if it can look do such a good job of imitating a turquoise, how is it different than actual turquoise? Well, remember we talked about at the beginning of this, the chemical composition. The chemical composition of a turquoise is a hydrous phosphate of copper and aluminum. Now, looking at your screen and you see that ha that how I can look an awful lot like it, well, that's where the similarities end. This has a um, chemical composition of calcium borosilicate hydroxide. Very, very different. Did you hear copper in there? Did you hear aluminum in there? I didn't. Um, so the other thing, and that's just the beginning of how they're different. We, when you start to compare all of those other attributes, like the Mohs scale of hardness, remember turquoise, five to six on the Mohs scale of hardness? Well, the howlite is only 3.5, so it's scratched very, very easily. Uh, and then you take a look at the refractive index, and you take a look at the, you know, the crystal structure, you take a look at all of those things. It is not in the same category as that turquoise group. So the next question might be, well, so why the heck does anybody buy this? Or is this just something where a jeweler or a stone dealer is trying to pass off something to me that isn't turquoise? Well, first of all, the thing that you need to remember is that any reputable gem dealer or stone dealer 
is obligated to give you any information you ask, whether it be about treatments, whether it be about what the stone actually is. So, how light is not turquoise, but it's a very uh, affordable simulated turquoise. As I said, it can look like it. So if you're on a budget and you don't want to spend the money for a more expensive turquoise, how light would be a pretty good bet for you. All right, so next on our list of the simulated fakes and wannabes is going to be a gem that's very near and dear to my heart. It is called Pristine, with a Y, P-R-Y-S-T-I-N-E. Uh, a lot of this comes from Nevada, and it, like Howlite, is a, ver a white stone that can really readily accept dyes. Now, I've never sold any of the dyed, uh, and, and Pristine is called white magnesite. So I've never uh, sold any of this, the dyed uh, magnesite, although I would have disclosed if I did. You can see how it just looks like this, but look at, look at the shine this takes. It takes a beautiful, beautiful, lustrous shine on that. Um, so what's the deal? What, how is that different? Once again, it is not a hydrous phosphate of copper and aluminum. It is a magnesite. And it's a pure white magnesite. It's beautiful. It will accept dyes again. But we get into the other attributes of the stone. Remember, if it is a uh, the hardness, remember five to six on the turquoise. This is three between three and a half. Uh, and if you're looking at the refractive index of this stone, one point five eight three to one point five nine eight, pretty close to the turquoise to be honest, because it has very similar turquoise is a little bit more uh, of that and the specific gravity is actually heavier a little bit heavier than what you get in the turquoise so anyway magnesite is is a fascinating gemstone and that could sometimes be dyed to be one of those imitations that look like turquoise but nope it's not turquoise and then we get to another gem that I am incredibly fond of. And um, especially, I'm going to show you, this is going to be pretty cool. Um, you know, here's, here's a piece of turquoise. It has all the attributes that we mentioned with turquoise. This is actually a big stone, and that's a, a, this is called chrysocolla. And a lot of people think, and it's often mistakenly sold. And I don't even think people are trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes because this is not a cheap gemstone, except if you get a really good gem quality piece. Chrysocolla is another copper associate mineral. Now, what does that mean, a copper associate mineral? That means that copper is in the makeup of chrysocolla, but it doesn't have some of the other attributes. So, but it is mined in many of the same places where copper is mined. In fact, uh, I'm sorry, where uh, turquoise is mined, which is because of the copper content, wherever copper is found, you're going to find turquoise. We're also going to find chrysocolla. I think it's a beautiful gemstone. It can look a lot like turquoise. You can find some that's a little bit less expensive, but you can also find some that has gem silica in it, and it will be a little bit more expensive. And, and, and when you have a, a, a silica gel that hardens in that chrysocolla, then you have uh, a pretty rare and beautiful stone. I've seen some amazing pieces actually I have I probably didn't bring it out out here with me oh yeah you, see, you may not be able to see it but do you see that that little silica like quartz is reflecting off of that but again often mistaken uh, for turquoise and if you've ever heard of something called the Eilat stone which was uh, the Israeli stone that's sort of a hybrid of some turquoise uh, components cr chrysocolla azurite malachite um, and that's also very, very much, even though it's much more chrysocolla than the other uh, elements, it's something that would be a good imitator or fake of a turquoise. Okay, those of you who are very astute in um, what they call continuity, which Judy's great at, by the way, uh, you might notice that something looks different about this shot. The lighting looks different, or maybe it's a little windier, or maybe Paul's beard has grown out a little bit more. <laughs> Well, good for you because you're right. You know, if, I don't know if you've ever gone to the airport and realized, like just as you got there, I forgot my passport or something like that. Well, we've done that too. Well, I had this all ready to go for today's lesson and then I realized I forgot one of the most important 
stones. I was so wrapped up in talking about all these different uh, fakes and simulants of turquoise, I forgot one that is, I think, one of the most important. And that is called verisite, which is what Sarma asked about in, in the original question. Verisite is probably the closest thing to turquoise without actually being in the turquoise group. Because you remember I talked about turquoise being a hydrist phosphate of copper and aluminum. Well, verisite is a hydrated phosphate of aluminum. No copper. And remember what I said before, you cannot have turquoise if you do not have copper. That's an essential ingredient to the turquoise. Um, it is also mined in the United States Southwest in prominent places such as Utah and Arizona, New Mexico, places like that, but probably not near as near the copper mines because there's no copper content in the verisite as all. Well. You'll see a little bit more of a green color in your verisite, not quite so much as you will see on our next stone, which is the phosphite, but it still uh, favors the look of turquoise and it could be something that you would want to wear. But remember, it's not a fake anything. In fact, you will find as you do more research that verisite is actually more rare to find than turquoise. So it's not really going to necessarily be on the cheap. And now we get into one of the most intriguing parts of the question that Sarma asked for at the beginning of this lesson. And that's called phosphite. And phosphite is not a fake anything. In fact, it is part of the turquoise group. I get it. So why are you saying, why don't they just call it turquoise or green turquoise? Because it has decidedly a, a, a much more of a green in the phosphite, and it's a very rare form of that turquoise. So it is because it's part of the turquoise group, hydrous phosphate of copper and aluminum. But in this particular case, and by the way, who was this named after? This was named after an American mineralogist by the name of George Tobias Faust. And um, he, he discovered this sometime towards the, uh, the, around the turn of the century, not this one, but the last one. And, uh, but anyway, what happens with phosphite? and I've seen it in person, and it is beautiful and it is expensive. So it's not a fake anything. Uh, Phosphite has copper and aluminum, but probably four times as much zinc in that stone than it has copper. Still has those trace elements of copper, and the copper probably came in later in the development of the stone and replaced some of the zinc that was dominating that stone. So you'll see some blues, but you see a lot of green, sometimes called the grasshopper uh, gemstone because there's so much green in it. But if you get your hands on some phosphite, if you're a collector, I would highly recommend it. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous stone. And that would be the phosphite. Now that does it for all the kind of natural gems, but I wanted to touch again. I know I gave you some other episodes where you could, you know, look at Turquoise 101 or real versus fake and what's simulated and what's natural. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about some other options for turquoise sort of alternatives. And one of them is you might have heard of something called compressed stabilized turquoise or reconstituted turquoise. And that's common with a lot of Chinese turquoise I've dealt with over the years, but it's done in some American turquoise as well, where they take really, really smaller bits of turquoise that weren't enough to make a, a, you know, a polish a stone out of, and they pulverize that, and then they put it in a multi, and they stabilize it and put it in a multi thousand pound uh, compressor, and they make it into these big uh, blocks of turquoise. Sometimes they dye them, sometimes they don't. But it's a way to get some more mileage out of turquoise uh, from turquoise that would rather regularly be unused or unusable. Um, is there a place for it? Absolutely. I've sold uh, some compressed Chinese turquoise over the years. What I always said about it, it is genuine turquoise. However, it has been treated. It has, has been uh, compressed. Sometimes if it's dyed, I disclose that it's been dyed. And some of those are actually even very desirable. Uh, for example, this is a piece of a compressed, and you can see it's just like in a block form. And this actually came from 
the Kingman mine. And that's something that uh, my friend Marty Colbaugh and his son Josh have been doing for a while, and it's really, really popular. In fact, one of the first top values I had when I was uh, selling my line on Shop NBC years ago was a purple Mojave turquoise. And then I followed it up later on with a green Mojave turquoise. Well, those are dyed. But turquoise can't always readily accept dye, and you have to have a certain color and quality of turquoise to even accept that dye. But that's an example of a uh, compressed and stabilized turquoise. Now, again, nothing wrong with that. And as long as anybody who's dealing in those stones, they need to disclose to you exactly what they are selling. And I never made any bones about it. And I told them, especially with the purple, I said, this is not a natural color for purple. It's something that we did that was fun and then we infused some bronze matrix in it. Uh, and so perfectly acceptable. One other thing, and this is this is something especially at the in the waning days of Sleeping Beauty, when the mine closed to what 2012, June 30th, 2012, I started to work with one of the biggest turquoise dealers in the world. This would have been about three or four years ago. His name is Ernie Montoya. He's out of um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. In fact, if you go to uh, downtown Albuquerque, there's a store there called SunWest Silver, and that's where you'll find Ernie Montoya, most important turquoise dealer in the world. We were working on something where technology could help replace people's appetite for the very expensive Sleeping Beauty. So he took some uh, turquoise from Mexico. They pulverized it. They had a way of they took out any of the impurities that would c cause the matrix and then they uh, stabilized it and added copper, the essential element, to get that blue color that they desired and it replicated it very, very well, but at a fraction of the cost and I always disclose that and I called it Sonora Beauty Turquoise. Uh, this is not Sleeping Beauty, it looks just like it. The only difference is that we're actually telling you what it is where a lot of people are probably trying to pass it off as Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. Well, I hope that cleared up some of the mystery of things like phosphite and howlite and magnesite when you're dealing with turquoise. So I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. If you did so, please hit that subscribe button. Remember, it says subscribe, but it's absolutely free, but it helps me to continue to do these lessons for you. So I hope you enjoy them. I'll see you next Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern time when my next lesson will be available. Thanks for watching.